Welcome back to Fire Drill. Uh, the first one of 2023. Hope you all had a good new year. Hope you're back into your podcast listening days. I know everybody's probably catching up at work, but find time for the Fire Drill. Real quickly, I get a lot of questions uh, about what the song that you just heard prior to right now is. And uh, our producer, Jake Muldowney, said, uh, told me that, uh, and I always make him answer it on Twitter because people ask me and I always forget. It's by Griffin House. And, in, and the, name of the, uh, thing, uh, the name of the song is Try Not to Think. And Jake has just told me that he's a huge golfer. And if he comes into town, shoot him a DM or shoot him a uh, message on Instagram. He might play golf with you. Uh, but everybody loves the song. I get tons of messages about it. So thanks to him for being our opening song. Um, first one of 2023, our plan was to do a preview of the majors and we did but we also as all fire drills do got totally off the rails there's a natalie Golbus story forgot natalie Golbus was a thing didn't know that it was uh uh that she dated dustin johnson didn't know that alan shipnick may or may not have had something to do with them breaking up uh great story why i love this podcast so stay tuned for that we talked about uh tiger possibly not being at some of the places that are the masters and how important it is we think for live guys to play well early and kind of legitimize everything that they're doing over there um, if they don't play well uh, we talked about Kapalu, talked about the elevated events what we're excited about leading into this uh year up into the masters when Corey connors wins the masters just my take on that uh so that's it this is the fire drill first one of the year uh I haven't had sleep in like two days. Pretty tired, but it was a great podcast. There's a, a, like Michael just tells a little anecdotal story joke at the end. I mean, it's just what the fire drill is. Uh, so everybody, thanks for the support in 22. We hope to have more and all of you back from the people who listen in 22 and 23. Before we get into it, I want to thank uh, uh, our two sponsors, Parpoints. Go make Park. Great scoring app. Go check it out download it new way to score in golf it is really awesome i know that's a hard concept to grasp but i promise you will love it when you do it and then uh dormy workshop artisanal now people a guy from ireland sent me an ad about cheese over the new year and the guy used artisanal in his cheese and he sent it to me via dm and they said hey you have some influence so the words artisanal uh club covers putter covers awesome support of us Dormy Workshop, go check them out. Uh, go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like, comment. I'm so sick of saying that. Please do it. Can we just get to like 1 million subscribers? So I can, if we get to 1 million subscribers, I promise I'll stop saying that. Okay? So please go do that. Thank you for all the support and all seriousness. We love you guys and girls. Uh, and uh, thanks for everything. Without further ado, here's the three of us talking golf. <laughs> Well, guys, it's 2023, but looking at your faces, it feels like 2022. Um, deja vu. We've done a lot of podcasting, but um, it's a new year. It's a new us. Let's uh, let's talk about the 2023 golf season. How excited are we? Anyone? Didn't the season just... Has the, was there an off season? <laughs> it's like 20 minutes. I mean, the bigger conversation is, is golf needed a, a off season? The answer is obviously yes. Uh, but it's hard to be excited. I mean, yes, I love golf, so I'm as excited as I would be for normal. But golf season's been going the entire year. So uh, no, I, is anyone really excited about the Tournament of Champions ever? Uh, I'm not. Uh, well, I am. I enjoy I it. I am. Wow. Why are you excited, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it starts the year. I For myself, I feel like I did have a break from golf this year. I don't know particularly why. Um, I didn't play a lot in December, and uh, we had some really cold, uh, uh, nasty weather here. I think I played once. I did play yesterday on January 1st. And uh, I love that start of the season thing. Um, I love watching Kapalu. I always have. Uh, I just think it's a great event, actually. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's I, to me, it's one of the most fun courses of the year. It's just it's all about geometry and and angles and um, 
obviously the the scenic backdrops. But no, but Ryan, it's this a, year the- it's a live event with less players. <laughs> That's well, a, given that wow. more holes, given, given, given that, that more holes live by about thirty or forty years, I, would, I understand. I would, but now it's twenty million. Different. Now it's twenty million for thirty-nine guys. So basically, everyone's getting you know I don't know what last place is, and uh, and you know I mean no one's really into the season because a lot of the guys aren't playing Sony. They're like kind of ramping up for Tory, you know. But I don't agree. You know, okay. Ryan, Ryan, you are old enough to remember when the All Star game was meaningful in baseball, especially yeah. since you are in proximity to both Detroit and Chicago. You had both you had teams on both sides of the aisle. That's Kapalua. It's 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 our hour, if I may use that phrase. It's our <laughs> it's our All Star game. Alan's been going for a long time. I've gone a number of times. Um, is that the course, Alan, that put Crenshaw on the Crenshaw and Coor on the map? Yeah, that was their first design. Wow. Amazing. I did not know first. Okay. Yeah. And they built such an interesting golf course on the side of a mountain. It's not easy to do. But, I mean, more to your point, Ryan, this is the start of, of the new world order for the PGA Tour. I mean, in in recent years, the Tournament Champions had, had, had been pretty sleepy because, uh, as as you know, a lot of guys had skipped it. They just didn't want to make the trip from Florida or they they just they just weren't that motivated. They wanted to have a longer off season. They wanted to you know get crunk on, on New Year's at home, whatever it was. But now, all the top PGA Tour guys are going to be there. Now, clearly, we're missing some of the live players, but you know you're going to have and Rory. Have What's that? And Rory, he's skipping. Well, yeah, I know, but you're still going to have you're still going to have a tremendous field. Um, that's a lot of guys who hadn't hadn't played Cap Lou in a long time, so. I think it's going to be a. Um, I think it's going to be a good show. You know, the t- no, I'll be curious what the tour does as far as um, hoopla. You know, I know Monahan's going to be there. He's going to meet the press um, at some point. I'll be you sitting mean, in the front. Meet you, Alan. Who yeah, I'll be sitting be in front. You and Doug. <laughs> I've, I've been trying to get a one on one with Monahan for a very long time for my my live book and. Uh, he keeps dodging me, even though he looked me in the eyes and shook my hand and said, "Yes, you know, we'll sit down and talk now." you know, citing the lawyer's concerns, like wanking motion. But I'm, so my only chance to talk to him is going to be at these press conferences. So I'm, you know, I'm, that's, I got to hit him with the questions there. It'll be interesting. But um, I, I think it's a big deal for the tour. I, I expect that they will, they will do some things to blow it out and maybe some more announcements. You know, that's kind of a traditional time. They, they did it at the tour championship this year, but often they've, they've made some sort of structural announcements at Kapalua. I wouldn't be surprised if Liv, just because they love to be the skunk in the garden party, will announce a signing. You know, that would be so typical on Thursday morning of the tournament champions. They're going to announce they've signed player X. So not Xander Shoffley. I didn't mean that. I know he's got an X in his name, but no, just uh, a player we don't know. And uh, so I don't do know. You, I think do you feel like you've been there a lot? Do you feel like there's any. Like I never pay attention to the tournament of champions, so I don't really feel any difference. But do you think that there's any more like build up? Do you feel anything social media wise or anything that you normally don't because of like it's an elevated event? Obviously, more of the stars, you know, all of the PGA Tour stars besides Rory will be there. Do you feel like it's different or maybe back to what it was, you know, back in the 90s? Not yet. I think today is when it'll start. Obviously, it's um, it's the start of, of the work week for some people on today on on Monday, and um, I'm gonna I'll be I'm clear if, if you know the backdrops. I'm here at home in Carmel. I'll be in Maui by tonight, and um, you know once I'm on the ground, really tomorrow on Tuesday, I'll, I'll have a better feel for if the energy's different. But I mean, it's always been a very sleepy feeling when you're at the event. Michael knows that. I mean, it's it's very intimate. Everyone stays at, at the same hotel. It's kind of that's another reason why it's a fun week. The observational reporting is fantastic because you bump into the players and their significant others all over uh, in the gym, in the elevator, at the restaurants. And so it's, it's fun to be there for reporters. You get to see a lot and you get to have a lot of quiet conversations in the hallway. I think I've told this story. I, I was staying next to Jesper Parnovic one year. That tells you how long ago this was. And every night the, they would leave a gift for the, for the players in the field and outside the door and Needless to say, the reporters were treated very well, but there were no gifts. And um, so one time there was this incredible array of like cookies and sweets. And it was there when I went to dinner and then I'm walking back to my room. It's still there. I figured Jesper's probably already asleep. 
And we know he at that point he was a real health food fanatic. He was eating so volcanic like, sand at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. So to help Jesper out, I liberated this this goodie basket, and it, it caught me through the entire week, and I have no regrets. It was delicious. So, um, have you like ever told happened. Jesper that part of that story? I don't think I have. I think <laughs> well, I, told, I told you just did, I, but uh, <laughs> I told Mia his wife, so he probably heard about it. This was years later. My guilty conscience. Statue but. of limitations. Had run yeah, out. exactly. <laughs> I researched what the Hawaii statute of limitations was for grand theft. But, uh, yeah, it was anyway. probably What's the name of the hotel over? right on the Honolulu course? Uh, the Hill, it oh, used yeah. to be a Hilton, I think. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right there um, where they play the Sony Open. Um, I think that's right. I can picture it. I don't know the name anymore. But uh, and it, has, it has an old timey name. And I once saw, uh, I was eating breakfast uh, next to Jesper there. Uh, and I'm wearing, you know, just regular reporter clothes. He came to breakfast in a robe. <laughs> and his hat. Underneath the robe. Did, Did he have him? his hat? <laughs> that would yeah. be so great if it was just his, his biker hat and his robe. That would be amazing. Well, I mean, Kafalua is particularly intimate because everyone stays there at the Ritz Carlton and they usually give us a decent media rate. So I've stayed there too. And, um, you, the things you see, I mean, I, I had a run there in, in like the, the the mid 2000s where i broke the adam scott um kate hudson um story because they were frolicking on the beach that and then the next year it was um dustin and natalie Golbus, and the year after that it was dustin and paulina like i was like tmz because you just you, you can't hide people there it's um it's, it's really funny like you just you just you're down at the pool like it's it's a great it's a great for Michael and I, especially the kind of reporting we like to do, where you're just kind of hanging out and observing in, in the shadows, it's fantastic. And, and that was in the aftermath of your Chad Campbell, Mrs. Chad Campbell reporting. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's that was a classic golf flow story. I, I mean, I've told this before. Do you want to hear my the full Dustin Natalie Golvis story because it is quite funny? Absolutely. I, yes, I know bits, of course. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's the whole thing. I, I don't think I, I do think with with fair warning, we should probably tell uh, the current Mrs. Dustin Johnson. Um, she yeah, Paulina Skip had about three minutes, I think, yeah. maybe four. Um, we'll we'll try and keep it tidy. But so, whatever this is, like probably 2012 ish. You know, Dustin was clearly one of the best players in the world, but had not reached his potential yet. And um, and so I went out to hang out with him in South Carolina. This was like probably o- October, and he had a live-in girlfriend. And we went to some meals, and we played with the dog. And he seemed very settled and very happy. And you know that was part of the story. Like, oh, hey, Dustin's growing up. And uh, little did we know. And so um, now the story was conceived as as like a master's preview. But that was just, that was when Dustin I could get some time with Dustin was in the the off season, as it were. And so so now fast forward to Kapalua, and I'm just standing out there in front of the clouds, and Natalie Golbus walks by, and I I've, I've known Natalie for years, and so I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Um, because it's a long way to be on you know Thursday or Friday of of uh, the tournament week, and she's like, "Well, I'm kind of hanging out with Dustin," and she was all giggly about. It. I was like, "Oh, really?" Um, and she said, "Yeah, yeah, you know, we're kind of." She's like, "I don't know what to call it," and um, I said, "Oh, you know, obviously this is like this is this is the, this was peak Natalie Golvis, right? This is like this is a big deal." And I I said, "Well, can can I? You want?" to I would like to write about this. He's like, well, I'll let Dustin handle our PR, which tells you how little she knew about Dustin because Dustin doesn't do PR, right? So anyway, um, so then she goes out and she walks she, she walks the 18 holes watching him play golf. And Golf Channel had her on camera, but they didn't show it. That that was like the sensibilities of the golf channel. Like they, they didn't want they didn't know what oh this is too this is too sexy. So no Natalie appeared. So it's still a secret. So I go down to catch Dustin as he comes off of eighteen, and you've never seen anyone sign their scorecard and bolt up a hundred yard hill like Dustin did because they hadn't seen each other. So Natalie's back at the hotel room. Dustin is like in a hurry to go see her. Right? I'm like shit. I, that was my chance to confirm it with Dustin, and he's literally like ran up the hill at like Carl Lewis in his prime. It's like, damn. So, but of course, everyone's staying at the hotel. I know where Dustin is staying and kind of figured Dustin might not have an assumed name. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the players check in under different names to protect their privacy. So I called the operator, have there with Dustin Johnson, please? <laughs> After waiting like, you know, half an hour. And so they, oh, yeah, sure, let me connect you. So it's ringing and ringing. I'm like, God damn it. And then Dustin answers the phone. He's like, hello? I'm like, oh, Hey, Dustin, it's Alan Shifnuck. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions real quick. I, I, I can't talk right now. Call me back an hour. Click. 
I'm like, oh, god damn it. So so now I'm, I've got this, this problem because you can't hide, as discussed, you can't hide Natalie Golbus at this hotel where all the reporters are, the whole golf world. Like, it's all going to get out. And so um, I call him back in an hour, no answer. Uh, I'm like, well, someone's going to break this story. So, you know, I sort of had Natalie's confirmation. I did some more snooping around, talked to other people. So anyway, this story goes up on golf.com. And of course, it goes crazy across the golf world, you know, because this is like a, a very, you know, appealing power couple in golf. Yeah, Natalie was a big, I mean, like, you know, Huge. was playing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was the, for better or for worse, she was the biggest star on the LPGA back then, along with Annika, even though Annika had about 70 more victories. And um, so now fast forward, Dustin is a defending champ at Pebble Beach and they fly him in for this media day in like February. And I haven't seen him since all this stuff happened. And meanwhile, Natalie has called me, her agents called me because things ended with Dustin abruptly. I don't, I don't know what had to do with my story or not, but, and like Natalie's people wanted me to, to send out a, a, a tweet saying, well, Natalie's shown so much, you know, class through all of this. Unlike Dustin, I'm like, I'm not going to get in the middle of this, this lover's quarrel. Like she has her own Twitter. She can do it. Like I'm not, no. And so, so I, I know there's some energy around there. So I, I get Dustin after the press conference. I'm like, Hey man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to blow up your spot. You know, it was just, I, I ran a Natalie, like it's, it's Kapalua. Everyone saw her, like someone had to write it. And he's like, Oh man, that's cool. Whatever. I don't care. And um, so then if you recall after Dustin was blowing major championships at a furious pace, everyone's like, he hasn't, he just, nothing bothers him. Like, I was like, well, that's the proof. Like I, I may have cost him his romance with Natalie Golbez, probably the old girlfriend back in South Carolina. And he was like, whatever, man, it's, it's no big deal. So that's always been some important insight to me into the Dustin Johnson psyche. I'll tell a really quick follow up on uh, on the, yes, uh, the Natalie Goldberg side of things. And I'm, Alan has heard the story before. Ryan probably has not. I'm um, playing golf with Trump. We're walking down a fairway. He's always got his phone out. And Trump calls uh, Natalie Goldberg and says, uh, I read in page six that uh, that Ben Roethlisberger. Is that pronunciation correct, Ryan? Yeah, sure. For Trump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That Ben Roethlisberger, that's funny, that Ben Roethlisberger uh, broke up with you. I want you to call page six and tell him that's wrong. You broke up with Ben Roethlisberger. No one breaks up with you. You break up with them. <laughs> yeah, it's all spin. Well, that's another thing. So then I was doing a story on Natalie and we were in an elevator um, from the hotel or whatever. And I this there'd been some some buzz about her and Ben Roethlisberger. So I asked her, she's like, no, 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 there's nothing there. And we're in the elevator and I see her phone. <laughs> she pulls out her phone and she's like right in front of me, like, I'm not snooping. She just did it. And there's like miss call, miss call, miss all from Ben. And then she go, te- like seven texts. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, nothing's going on there, Natalie, sir. So. Alan, have you ever done a, psych- a psychological comparison and a biographical comparison between Natalie's father and Dustin Johnson's father? <laughs> um, yeah, Natalie's father was a trip. I mean, he looked like like a Harley, maybe like a member of the Hell's Angels, right? And he he followed every hole, which I don't blame him. He was sort of like low key security, and he was very watchful and very standoffish with reporters, but a smart guy and certainly helped create this, this brand that, um, where is you know, Natalie Golbus? Does she do TV? A little bit. Didn't she do one of the matches or something? She, yeah. Um, yeah. She, I mean, she had a lot, of, she had back injuries and she just was just kind of hanging on. Well, so I knew she stopped playing, but she yeah, just kind of like disappeared. Yeah. She grabbed, I think she's in Las Vegas. I see her on social every now and then, but yeah, she, she kind of paved the way for Lexi Thompson with that, uh, very tall, very athletic slug. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It sounds like it, but I mean, that's kind of what they both did. They just slugged it. Well, they both had, I mean, really funky moves, like, yeah. um, but somehow, you know, hit the ball pretty well. Um, yeah. And, you know, Dustin Johnson's dad has always been out of the spotlight, right? You know, he's, yeah, never, true. Yeah. he's never in the galleries. As the story goes, after the parents split up, it was it was it was not a pleasant divorce, and Dustin and and, and Austin kind of became distant from their dad. So he he has not. I mean, he's he he's super tall, and he comes from a family of of, of athletes. I believe Dustin's dad is in the South Carolina Hall of Fame as a basketball player. He was like six seven, and so clearly the dad gave him a lot of um, athletic tools. But I don't know how much of a factor he is in in his life anymore. So. It's interesting, though. I mean, the, um, 
you know, the dads are often the key to, to these, these golfers and what on the PJ tour or the LPJ tour. But, um, yeah, Dustin's dad is a little, a little bit of a enigma. All right. Well, so yes, the tournament championship is going to be interesting. I'm going to be there. I'll be writing uh, a lot for firepitcollective.com doing social stuff. Um, maybe some podcasts, who knows? So that, that's going to be interesting. It's going to be let's different look. that you have a, uh, a media credential, Alan. Can we talk about that on this podcast or no? Are we going to lose yeah, it? Yeah, sure. I mean, right. we, this is a full disclosure podcast. Um, th- this is also funny when people have accused you know us at their times of being shills for the PGA Tour. What they don't realize is they weren't credentialing us all year last year because uh, we were at loggerheads with the tour for a, a few different things we don't have to get into, but we had... Maybe we've just been battling the tour off and on that some of their some of their media regulations are onerous in the extreme and um, for example, just as an example, hypothetically, <laughs> you cannot live tweet about the eight hundred the eighteen hundred and thirty seventh ranked player in the world as he is T thirty nine at the AT and T Pebble Beach Pro Am hypothetically the field speaking, of which of was course. totally ravaged by the, the Saudi event that was that week and the right. tour was desperate for attention and we were trying to promote their product hypothetically um, hypothetically Alan I am sitting on the edge of my seat here are you telling me you don't have a national press credential from the PGA tour I, I, I do as of a, f- a few weeks ago so I'm, I'm I'm back in the good graces with the tour theoretically but it took some time on yeah, what took- basis did you struggle to get it well, so there was there was two things. I mean, it goes back to um, whatever thirteen months ago, the Wishbone Brawl, when we decided to live stream it. That was and Freddie and Xander were in the field, and the tour was of the position that we needed. They needed to get releases, and as we know, the the, the getting a release is a big deal. That's what's keeping guys from playing the Live Tour, and the tour takes it seriously. They didn't tell us that until the morning of the Wishbone Brawl. Like we felt like ah, it's a charity event. It's all the money's going to junior golf. Um, but that was the week of um, the, um, the RSM tournament in Sea Island. And so, you know, Xander's a gold medalist. He's obviously a star. Freddie's Freddie. And so um, at like the minutes before we were going to go with this live stream, which took an incredible amount of work, and she'd been promoting for weeks, and the tour had said nothing. And they finally like, and there was already a thousand people on the grounds. And so we're on literally Xander and Fred are talking to top guys on the tour while they're hitting balls. Like Fred is holding his phone and warming up with one arm is actually really cool. And the tour people are calling us and making all these threats. And it was like, well, we're, it's too late. We're too far down this road. And so we live streamed it. They were very upset about that. And, um, uh, and then, you know, a couple months later was the, the Crosby clam bake where Ryan was catting for Mark Baldwin. And we didn't, I had COVID. I wasn't even on the grounds, but the rest of our crew did not have credentials. They came in as fans and, you know, fans are allowed to, to post videos and do all kinds of fun stuff that reporters are not. And so it's kind of a gray area. If you work for a media company, but you don't have a media credential, what can you do? It was, it was not, it was not settled law as um, Brett Kavanaugh would say. And so um, we wanted to post in some fun content about Mark Baldwin. The tour took exception to that. Um, and so, yeah, they weren't credentialing us. It wasn't that big a deal because, you know, then we got into the major seasons and obviously they don't control the major championships. So we were on site for all of those. Um, and then after a lot of back channel communication, I wound up at the tour championship. And that was a, really the first tour event I covered in 2022. Um, uh, but I got shut down, Michael, from taking pictures inside the ropes as a caddy, which it does say you, you sign a thing when you take a caddy. But it is very much a rule that is overlooked. If you go and follow tour caddies on social media, there is never not a week where there is a video of a practice round or shots from the range or something from the above. I was not taking pictures, obviously, during rounds. It was on the range prior to the round or on the putting green or pictures of stars as they walked by, like Mark was warming up next to Ray Romano and you know things like that. And they said I couldn't and... I emailed them back with seven pictures of Caddy. Caddy's taking pictures, but they didn't look too kindly on my response. So, yeah. So um, here we are. You know, we here at the Fire Pit Collective, we're, we're it's a rock and we're a punk rock operation. We, you know, we kind of like to do things our way, but uh, that will get you in running afoul of various PJ Tour regulations. So, uh, but 
I think we're, we're, uh, they've seen the kind of coverage we want to do and they want us to be there. So we're, I do have a season credential as of, you know, for, for this season, which I'm, it's, it's helpful from a bureaucratic standpoint, but the big deal is the, if you could still apply on a weekly basis, like this is what I did for the tour championship, but those people don't get into the, the clubhouse and I don't think they have, they don't, they don't have practice facility um, access. And as, as you guys know, and probably a lot of the listeners, most of the best interviews you get are either in the locker room or on the driving range or on the putting green. And so it, it made or the it, hotel lobby or the hotel lobby <laughs> yeah. or on the phone or on the phone, occasional weeks like that. Um, but I do have another cap. I do have another Rich Carlton Kapalua story. We can we can sidebar that for next week. But um, so yeah, it's helpful to have the season long badge because it just make, lets me do my job more effectively, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I'll try and follow the rules. I really will. We'll see how it goes. Probably not. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so let's look ahead a little bit into the the 23 season. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of great events. Obviously, the Phoenix Open elevated uh, same week as the Super Bowl. That's going to be an absolute melee, and that should be fun. Um, I think the LA Open might be the best tournament in golf, personally. Um, of course, I'm, I'm always looking forward to Pebble Beach. But um, between now and the Masters, let's say, what are you guys excited about? Can I, a quick question. You both now have used the word elevated. Are you telling me that this is now in the lingua franca of PGA Tour conversation? Because unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not using it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, the oh, question, in, except for in this instance, is Pebble Beach elevated? I assume not. No, but no. This this is inside is. information. It's going to be next year. Um, I, with the Not tour, anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but what the tour has realized is by uh, what, what's a synonym for elevated? What should we call it? Special? We'll call them these creating these special tournaments. Um, you know, for whatever a dozen of them, they're leaving behind two thirds or three quarters of the schedule. It, it's kind of like you know, if, in elementary school, they used to have that gifted and talented education. They pull a few kids out. Hey, they're the smart kids, and all you kids who got left behind, you're the dumb ones. Like they they just banned the whole program because it was bad for the self esteem of the other students. It's, it's exactly like that on the PGA Tour. Like, um, so they have to they have to sprinkle around the gifted and talented tag to the other tournaments in the coming years. Or what's the incentive? Like, why pay eight million dollars to not get any stars, not get any love, get get no media? So. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that they're going to have to they're going to have to rotate that that tag. Which, if if everyone's elevated, then no one is elevated. I don't know. It gets it gets really funky. Monahan's going to start sending out bumper stickers that reads, "Every tour player is a what is that middle school thing? You know, is yeah. a prize. Honorable. Yeah, <laughs> is an honorable PGA tour on this PGA tour. It's kind of useful for us because it's uh, it shows how naked this whole thing is. You know, we've all discussed this all last year. Or, you know, since they came up with this uh, this scheme, uh, it's their way of being uh, live light. Really, is these elevated tours. So I guess you know when you think about it that way, it is a, a legitimate thing. It's killing their own a word. I cannot stand to use product because uh, instead of having a series of events, which is the PJ Tour, it's now like watch us this week. Don't bother for a couple of weeks. Watch us this week, and that's not really the, that's not really tour. But everything is changing. Like even this start of the season, Kapalua, this was the way golf was. Here's your mellow start to the mellow new year. We'll work always slowly to the Florida swing, and then. The Masters will come and then kind of ramp ramp up to the U.S. Open. Then after the U.S. Open, really, the golf season was over. That's all over. Now, everything is special all the time because that's how life is. Special. We're special. Every child at this middle school is special. <laughs> I love We should have done the podcast. Takes, I yeah, podcast. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I can't top that. Ryan, like, what are you looking forward to? You were starting to say. Okay, seriously, and I'm not joking. The Waste Management Monday Qualifier will be the greatest Monday Qualifier in the history of the PGA Tour. Not joking. That's not an exaggeration. Not hyperbole. Nothing. 130 play, 120, 32 player field. So it's a field that's short. It's elevated event. So all the top players outside of the players that use their one, they don't have to play. But most everyone. So that the field's always good anyway. Now it's going to be even better. It's a $20 million purse. Everybody's going to come to the Monday that is not eligible because they want to get in on a $20 million tournament. 
be make some for some great stories. It's always a great Monday qualifier. Anyway, legitimately, there might be two hundred players in the Monday qualifier. How can you get two hundred guys on on one course? Well, you're going to have to do it in two waves over two days. Oh, really? The Monday qualifier yeah, it always two days. That always, Michael, that Monday always goes into Tuesday anyway. There's usually, you know, six or seven groups left on the on the course for Tuesday morning. That it's always a, a huge Monday anyway. Um everybody lives there, proximity, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you know, a lot of like former PJ tour winners that are like, I don't know if I want to go to a Monday are gonna go to this one, I would think, because it's a twenty million dollar purse. A Jonathan so, Bird. Yeah. Well, Jonathan plays a lot of them, but yes. Yeah. I mean, Ben Crane, he's not going to travel all the way across the country. Probably will because it's a $20 million purse. Uh, I just got a text uh, yesterday from uh, the Southwest PGA section uh, director, and there's already 425 players signed up for the pre-qualifier. There's nine pre-qualifiers. So it'll be 700 players in the pre-qualifier. Uh Basically, if you're in the pre-qualifier, you have to shoot back-to-back 63s to get into the Waste Management Open. Um, Ryan, are you going to cover that live in, in the flesh? I think you should. Yes, 100% I'm going to be there. Uh, I, I have a great story about the Waste Management uh, via Scott Berliner, who is a like kind of legendary uh, grinder, but he, he's a, a pro in uh, New York, I believe. So the Waste Management uh, used to have... A Monday qualifier, there's no pre-qualifiers back in the day. They had uh, three s- sites for a Monday qualifier with one spot at each. Okay? And they always used to fill up. And Scott Berliner has a... Uh, so you can imagine a one spotter. You're playing in a 100-person field for one spot. Scott Berliner has like a 2 o'clock tee off time. He shows up and a guy has shot 58. <laughs> He's he's teeing it up, knowing that he has to shoot a fifty-eight to get into a playoff to get into the Monday qualifier, and he spent like you know three hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to get there. Uh, so that's the waste management. Uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Pre Corey Connors winning the Masters. I, I I I hear your reservations, Michael, but definitely the West Coast wing is is going to be juiced this year because um, because of of this new energy around around these these events. So. Uh, that's going to be a fun one. Uh, the Masters, of course, is always a big deal, but it's going to have extra um, significance this year. Really bringing together all these players. Uh, you know, Fred really put that statement out a few weeks ago, saying what we, we, we the only position the Masters could take is if you're if you're qualified, you can come play. It would have been a travesty if if they start banning players. I mean, they don't need to get involved in this turf war. The Masters, they get. One week a year, the mandate of Augusta National Golf Club is to put on its best possible tournament. So, so you're bringing together these live guys and the tour. You know, it will have been the first time since since St Andrews when things were still unsettled. I mean, at that point, Cam Smith had not officially jumped to live, um, even though we felt like it was coming. Um, and the, the battle lines have hardened. So, um, it's going to be interesting. A, a place that that strives for this artificial gentility and this, this very controlled environment like the fresh in there is going to be delicious how much are you looking forward to this masters michael you know i i think i don't know how they're going to do it but i think fred ridley and company will rise to the occasion and will use this masters to create some kind of olive branch between these uh, warring factions because you know, this is a cliche, but it's born in truth. You know, they're, they're always asking themselves, what would Bobby Jones do? Bob Jones would do what's ever best for golf. And this whole situation is not best for golf. Um, and I don't know what the answer would be, but I think this master is going to be very significant in trying to bring together the uh, the warring parties. I mean, it's not like these guys haven't mixed. You know, they were at the J.P. McMass Pro-Am. They were, they were at, at the Open Championship. It, there's been some of these European tour events where some, some of the, the live players have, have – been able to play because of this this temporary restraining order so it, i don't expect any cat fights um, but um, the masters uh, dinner on tuesday night for the past champions is going to be quite interesting when you put in a small room and you know phil bowed out of, of the festivities at st andrews um, but I, he's not going to miss that so you're, you're going to have tiger and phil in the same room with 
with Jordan and, and, you know, these tour loyalists and you have Gary player who's, who's on Phil's side and, you know, he's not one to bite his tongue. And, and then you have, you have Dustin, you have Bubba, Patrick Reed, you have Patrick Reed, you have all these, these, you know, they're probably going to put them on in the corner sitting together, but it's just, that is going to be a great theater. And, oh man, maybe I could pairings, maybe I can, pairings will be interesting. It'll be a like, lot. I mean, parents will be super interesting. Yeah. So I wonder about Sergio and Alothabal. I wonder, you know, Alothabal is such a traditionalist, and uh, I, I wonder how that relationship has evolved. You, you know what's evolved. interesting, though, Michael, is is I've been tunneling deep into the um, the Greg Norman World Tour debacle of 1994. The one player who really supported Norman from start to finish was Jose Maria, and you know that that was the the first real attempt at disruption of, of the PGA tour model. And he faxed, he faxed Norman, his support and Norman held up, waved this paper around and read from it at it, it, it critical times. So uh, it, it, I, I can see Seve's fingerprints all over that one. Well, that's true. Cause there was this kinship between Seve and Norman because they were both raging against the machine in the eighties of trying to be international players, trying to get, get status on the PGA tour. And, you know, back then, uh, Dean Beeman wanted Seve to play 15 events in America, like in addition to playing Europe and the major. It was, and so, you know, Seve got suspended from the tour for a year. And so there's, you're right about that. I mean, the, the, the Seve, Seve had no love for the tour and I'm sure that was an influence on, on Jose Maria, but, um, so yeah, he's, he's an interesting person in all of this. And I've been trying to get an audience with him too. And he's very elusive as you know, but, um, that's the one week. So uh, it, it's going to be he's, tough, gonna he's be good tough. in a hotel lobby. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've seen, that's how we knew. So Michael and I are sort of gourmands. Like we like a good meal and the major championships, um, you wind up in these random places uh, where no one really knows the city that well. And, and so, uh, and especially in the, like the pre Yelp days, like in the nineties, it was all word of mouth. So we'd often wind up at these restaurants where there was a lot of tour players, uh, and that's how we knew we were in the right one. If Jose Maria was there pouring red wine, it's like, okay, we're definitely yeah. in the right place. Cause yeah. He, uh, or, or Alan, the, my only butter comment that we, or few tour players, but if, but if the ball was there, you knew you were in the right yeah. place. That's like, I love Thai food. And so, um, like three, three tournaments in a row, I wound up at, at the same Thai restaurant as, um, th- uh, Thong Hai JD. And that's like, okay then I know I'm in the, I'm in the spot. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, like, finally I started nodding at him. He's like, okay, I see you. He's like, you know, you know, what's up. It was, there was a, a real, a, a real moment there. But um, anyway, real, real quick about the masters as why we're on it. Uh, Jake, our producer, wonderful producer. What shout out Jake uh, asked me to bring this up. Cause it's very good. Just happening on, on social media right now. Scott Stallings hasn't played in the masters uh, since 2014. Had to look that up just now while we're on it. But, uh, I mean, guys, as you guys know, and everybody listening probably knows, get super excited, especially when they haven't been to the Masters in a long time, waiting for the official invite. And so Scott Stallings tweeted today that he has been running out to the mail the last four or five days, waiting for his invite that never came, and got a DM today from a guy named Scott Stallings, who has the same name as his wife, who got Scott Stallings <laughs> master invite. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, if I, I have that, Stalling, I have I'm a story. Up, waving that, that around, man. I'm going. Yeah, that's what I said. I said, why did he, why did he message him? Just like, Hey, I got it, dude. But second of all, uh, I have met a, a guy messaged me at a Monday qualifier and said, Hey man, I'd love to meet you. I'm a big fan. And his name, Ryan French and Jake put in a picture right here. We look kind of the same and uh, it's kind of crazy. And um, so, yeah, so Scott Stallings, some guy in some town got uh, Scott Stallings master's invite in the mail. That's spectacular. Well, you know, there's, there's a golf writer named Adam Shupak, which sounds a little bit like Alan Shipnuck. And so we often get confused probably to the detriment of poor, poor Adam. And <laughs> yeah, but uh, I got a phone He's like, call. I didn't write about Phil. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. No, he gets a lot of blowback. It's so great. But sometimes every now and then someone tweets, thank you so much for this kind, you know, Adam's a great guy and he's a tender soul. So it's like, thank you for this very kind story you wrote about me. I'm like, hey, no problem. Happy to help you out. But um, the other day I got a call from Noda Begay and um, 
I mean, I, I know Noda casually. I haven't talked to him in a long time. I was like, hey, Noda, what's up? He's like, man, you know, I can't thank you enough for everything you did. And it was like so heartfelt. I almost, I was almost going to go along with it, but because Adam had just done a story about Noda's foundation and all that. But I, I, so I had to tell him and, but I have to say no to man, like what a professional. He said, oh yeah, you're right. I'll call him, but I got to tell you. And he like went in this whole like uh, long discourse about how much he appreciates me and the work I'm doing. I was like, wow, that was like, that's the TV gene right there. He, he had a Ooh. producer in his ear. He got <laughs> yeah. some new information. You got Shipnik. You got Shipnik on. <laughs> he just went with it. It's so funny. Um, that was uh, a terrific piece that, uh, that Adam did on, on Nota Begay. There's a lot there. You know, there, yeah. there's, I mean, that's an underrepresented community in golf, if ever there was one, uh, uh, Native Americans. And, and, and he's uh, had a rough life. I mean, he's had, yeah, yeah, had yeah no, I mean, very good story. And I'm reading Adam's book about um, Dean Beeman and the formation of the PGA Tour. It's really good. I mean, I've learned a lot. The, the, it, a lot of it's just super esoteric and it's a small audience that would care, but like some of the inner workings of how it all happened is, is is really well done so shout out to adam shupak um who's not part of this podcast but maybe should be um although maybe i gotta say he's got, he's got the same hair as michael like we could probably we could probably sneak him in once in a while and people you know they have, they especially have, like, with michael's normal uh poor lighting you know we could sneak <laughs> him in and no one would know <laughs> yeah i'll talk to shupak up, you know, swim, can you send it. um can you send adam a, a a pair of christine's glasses and, and <laughs> so yeah. you can yeah if we backlight him, if we backlight him no one will have any no, idea no one It'll will just have be any silhouette. Idea. <laughs> most likely to be a successful rapper among the golf media adam shupak <laughs> oh it's a great name um all right so the pga championship uh as we press ahead with what's supposed to be semi preview of the year even though our, our hearts let me get my parka <laughs> Oh, one second we said we were going to keep this to 45 minutes we're at 41 already no we're not yeah we are look in the top right corner all right 41 minutes the pga championship is at uh, oak hill it's going to be cold um the u.s opens at la country club it's going to be warm <laughs> and the british opens at, um, at hoy lake Should it's going to be windy <laughs> it's going to be windy <laughs> thanks for listening no uh, uh but I mean, honestly, the PJ Championship in early May in Rochester is a roll of the dice. It, it could be cold. Like this May, May 2022, on the same date the PJ is supposed to start, it was like 39 degrees or something. It was chilly. So that's going to be fun. I can't wait for the complaining. You know who was really pissed when they changed the dates on the PJ ch- uh, Championship for, for just this reason? Who? Herb Kohler. Yeah. 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 Uh, you're knocking out definitely northern venues. I mean, this is this is really an experiment. It's going to be fun. I mean, um, I, I I always root for chaos. So obviously, I want a live guy to win the Masters, and I want it to snow during the PGA Championship. Like that's the best possible scenario for this this golf season. Alan, some of these live stars from yesteryear. Cam Smith is an exception, but a Brooks Kepka or a Patrick Reed. I mean. In a normal year, had they not jumped to live, they'd be in the conversation. We are hearing almost nothing about them. How do you think, I don't know if your reporting would have gone this far yet, but how do you think they view their lives now? They've taken the money, they're going to keep making the money, but they're really not in the mainstream, not of our golf conversation uh, anyway. Um, and I don't know if, of, of anybody's. I think it probably hurts Brooks's pride a little bit because he liked to be the man and he was puffed up about it. And um, at the same time, you know, like I, Pat Perez, for instance, has said this to me. He's like, I don't have to care about anything anymore. He's like, I'm good. I'm rolling with Liv. I don't have to do the interviews. I don't have to get sucked into the drama. Like, I'm, he's like, it's such a relief. You, you can just opt out of everything. You can just say no to everything. Like you, and sucked into the drama. He was an aging player who had, had a you know long, long run and made a lot of money. What does he even mean? Well, I know, yeah, but he was also a go-to guy because he was such a good talker. So when there'd be some little flare-up on tour, like yeah, um, and you know he was close to Tiger. He was emphasis on was, and um, so there was just that's a, just one example. But you know, I mean, Brooks Tepka, he's out on a, on a yacht in the Italian Riviera. Um, and he flies straight into a live event, probably no practice round. Like, I don't think I don't think he has any regrets. Um, and I still think they're in the honeymoon period, whether you think it's going to be a success or not. I would assume the guys that are on the live tour are like, hey, this is part of the growing pains. Yeah, we're not part of the golf conscious, right? 
on top of mind right now, but we will be in X amount of years or next year or whatever. I mean, I assume there's part of that. And again, for those that are saying that we hate live, we don't. We, we well, I don't know if we do. I do. Kind of do. But <laughs> they're definitely part of the golf conscious. I'm just saying they're not top of mind, as Alan and Michael just said. Like, yeah, you're not going to Brooks and hearing from them week after week. You're not hearing from Bryson as much outside of like social media stuff. You know, you're not, yeah, just not prominent. Well, they're just the, the, the press isn't at the live events. I mean, um, Doug Ferguson hasn't been a single one, you know, he, he's basically the voice of, of, of golf for, for many outlets, you know, he, like Doug Ferguson's copy shows up in the Monterey Herald sometimes as the associated press writer, you know, and all these newspapers that don't cover golf, really, they, they will, they will, they will plug in Doug stuff when, when they feel like it. And, uh, he's, he's just, he's just opted out of live entirely. And, you know, I actually, I stopped going to the events last season because, they were shutting down players from doing interviews and that's really why I didn't go to Thailand and Saudi Arabia more than anything is it's a long way to go to not be able to get people to talk to you, but they just, they were, they kind of put a, a corporate chill on doing interviews. And so they're there. I know they have to be rethinking that strategy because they, they need, they need the oxygen that the media provides and everyone kind of buzzed in for the one what's happening with live golf story or, or the big picture, you know, think peace, but that's done now for in season two, you're not going to get the New Yorker. They're not going to show up. You're not going to get um, some of these other people who, who helped stoke the conversation. Like you really need the golf press. And uh, if you can't attract, if you can't attract any of the writers to go to the, to the events and the podcasters and um, they're, they're going to have to be a little more inclusive and, and play ball more. They, I mean, they were obviously it was like the siege mentality, um, and I, I know they felt under attack and obviously me getting tossed out of the first event at London, like the, the things that get off to a great start. So I will be curious how live as an institution handles the press because they're going to have to actually build some bridges. For instance, I, I've sent multiple texts to the head of their communications this guy named Jonathan, and I've sent multiple emails to Ari Fleischer, who's kind of their de facto vetter of things. They haven't even responded to me. It's like, that's not the best way to um, to deal with a reporter who wants to write about you. <laughs> I think back to the majors, guys, I think it's so important. Obviously, Cam is probably the best player in the world, one of the two best players in the world for sure. But I think it's it's important if you're a live from a live perspective that guys win or play well in the majors because it's, I mean, it's just like if everyone, if Brooks and Bryson and, and, uh, Dustin, I'll come to, um, I'll come to Augusta and miss the cut. That is a huge hit. I mean, they have to be relevant in order to say like, Hey, we're relevant, you know, because they're so top heavy on the live tour that their top guys just have to perform. I mean, it's just, it, it there is a lot of pressure. Like Cam, again, probably the best player in the world will probably perform. Uh, but the other guys have to perform too. And those guys are kind of, Outside of Cam, the guys are starting to be out of the conscious. Like Brooks has had a lot of injuries. Dustin's, you know, not a top. Like Bryson's had a lot of injuries, but it wasn't that long ago. He was the best player in the world. And uh, and I, I just think Augusta is huge for the live tour. I just really, really think to, to be a part of the conscious the rest of the year, they need to play well. Completely agree with that. Uh, and Cam Smith especially, because Dustin Johnson, you kind of never know with him. But for, of course, to you know, historically speaking, except for Tiger and Big Jack, guys don't follow up career years with career years. So expecting too much from Cam Smith is uh, is unrealistic. Uh, but I I completely agree with you, Ryan. For them to for to, to the mainstream golf fan for Live Golf to look relevant on those few chances when those guys all do get to play in the same field which is basically the four majors they've got to perform. And I also think they can gain a huge amount of men, you know, momentum. If it's Cam Brooks and Bryson at Augusta, everybody's going to go like, whoa, nilly. The PGA tour is in deep shit, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. on some levels, ridiculous. It's such a small sample size. We know in golf. Agreed. Like, Agreed. I'm just thinking the just casual golf fan, fan doesn't yeah. think that way. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. Know, but along those same lines, this hasn't really come up. So, Tell, tell me if I have this right. I guess I do. The uh, This will be the first players championship where you're really missing all the name players 
the defending you champion, know, uh, for instance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they took that, his parking that, spot now. Doesn't even have parking. Say again, they took Cam Smith's parking lot, the parking yeah. spot down. Yeah. So, I mean, that event takes a very big hit without its defending champion, without Dustin Johnson, without Brooks Kepka, even without Patrick Reed. Phil's, Phil's a past champion of the players. I mean, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, no, I agree. It, the majors are huge. And I will say I'm really excited about the U.S. Open at L.A. Country Club because that is such a cool course. And um we don't get new venues that often. And when we do, they've, you know, they, it was Chambers Bay and it was Aaron Hills. And, um, you know, I was rewatching the Chambers Bay open and that was such an unbelievable finish. I mean, so much great stuff happened there. It, it, it was, I, to me, that was one of the best opens in a long time, but it was wonky because of the greens and, um, but the court from T to green, that course looks so good on TV and, and, and LA country club, super visual, uh, and it has a long pedigree, even though it's, it has this renovation now. So, um, to to get to go to to go to that course, I think is going to be really fun. The architecture nerds are going to love it. It's going to look incredible on TV. The players are going to love it. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic open. And you know, LA they don't really support the LA Open that much. Like I think it's the it's just it's never been a part of the. The, the sports culture in that town, but LA does love a big event and the U S open is a big brand. And I think, I think the crowds will be great. I think there'll be a lot of flashy people in the gallery and I, I think it's going to be a, a fun tournament. So that, that's, that's, I'm more excited about this U S open than, than, you know, some of the other recent venues. I just think, I think it's going to be, it's going to be cool. Alan, as someone has, who has spent, as you have a lot of nights in Los Angeles and been around LA golf a lot, how do you think the Cognoscenti compare the idea of having, uh, an, a u.s open in los angeles at la country club versus riviera yeah it's interesting you know la country club is is such a proud institution and it, it's really a, it's kind of the it's the the blue bloods of la they forever they've they've been prideful that they have no actors among the members like it's really it's um it's 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 lawyers and it's politicians and it, it's people who run the city outside of the entertainment industry and <clears throat> excuse me so whereas Riviera is has has got celebrity members and it, but LA Country Club is a place where where there's there is there's so much pride in their courses and the um whereas Riv you know is very corporate like um it's it does it doesn't. Riviera is the best course with kind of the worst membership in LA, I think is how people look at it. And whereas LA country club is, is just, it's, it feels, it feels like an East coast joint in a lot of ways and um, for better and for worse. So uh, I, I think the, the, the golfing community, I think thinks this is really cool. It, it's become kind of the crown jewel of LA golf in some ways, and it's going to get, it's going to get the recognition it deserves. And uh, I mean, let's face it, Riviera, I mean, they, they can't get people to turn out even to that event week you know year after year when they had the pga championship there it was kind of famously a disaster when elkington won and so um you know la golf has not been on the map as far as the big time tournaments um for a very long time so i i think i think i think this will become one of the one of the anchor courses um, do you really yeah i mean i in other words in other words uh well i mean you've got pebble and are you saying instead of Tory Pines, uh, you you would see you'd expect yes. to see a lot it's, more of this? Than the- it's it's such a better golf course than Tory, and it's the the big time energy of, of Los Angeles. If, if you know they've they've sold out all the the corporate stuff, I think they've sold out the tickets. Like I, I think it's going to be it's going to be a home run, and I I think that yeah. it it'll definitely bump aside Tory Pines, and um, and I, so I, I think it's going to be an impactful U.S. Open for sure. Um, well, can I give you a quick my quick shorthand on please. is it LA is it North or South North? Here's my quick shorthand on LA North. If you like Augusta National and you like Pine Valley, you're going to love this LA North because it's really got ele- elements of both. But and this is a very significant but it doesn't look like a U.S. Open course at all. I mean, when I was last there, there were basically no trees whatsoever. I don't know what they're going to do for rough. When I was there, it was like Augusta National used to be. It was just a wide open playing field with very little rough. Uh, so it's a different kind of U.S. Open, and it doesn't have that super traditional that that Riviera definitely could. It doesn't have that super traditional U.S. Open values. But as you say, as is as a spectacular place, it's definitely a spectacular place to me. Torrey Pines on the Pacific Ocean was spectacular on TV, and was spectacular to be there. 
maybe not a great, great golf course, but certainly a very good golf course. Well, Torrey is enigmatic because um, a lot of people hate it as as a championship venue because it's such a basic design. Like the whole, most of the holes are linear. There's bunkers on both sides. It, it's very prescribed golf. Whereas, as you're saying, LA North, there's different ways to play every hole, and there's more decisions to make. And um, I think it'll appeal to that that kind of golf viewer. But um, yeah, I, there's no doubt it's going to, I think, surpass Tory and. The, the odd thing about Torrey Pines is it's had two U.S. Opens and both have been epics or decided on the last hole by, you know, when Rom won, he was the best player in the world. So it's produced the leaderboard you want. It's just it's not the most artful uh, canvas if you're if you're into that sort of thing. But if you want an exciting finish with with top players like Torrey's delivered. So I don't know. Well, we'll see. But I, I, I do think that L.A. North is going to this is not going to be its only U.S. Open. <laughs> And Alan, let me let me correct myself here because I I could see that in your knowing nod. I'm sure you knew this. God willing, we'll all be covering it. The 2039 U.S. Open is scheduled for LA Country Club on its north course. Yeah, yeah. When, and those are those USGA things are interesting. Like, I would like to know what the wiggle room is on you know they schedule these tournaments you know 25 years out. Like, what is the out clause if um, there's like who knows what, like what if LA is underwater what does exactly I um, mean, if, what do you do yeah the the san andreas fault runs right below the third fairway of and i'm just i just made that up but like you just you never know so um but anyway um all right let's let's go to hoy lake which of course is the the scene of one of tiger's great performances we'll even show up there we haven't we're we're deep into a preview about the 2023 season we haven't even mentioned the words tiger woods unbelievable but i guess that's the sign of the times um, I mean, it's, it's, it'll be, it'll be melancholy if he's not there. Cause that, that really, I know you're, you were on site for that, for that tournament, Michael. So was I, there was something sort of magical about that burnt out moonscape of the golf course and tigers hitting four irons closer than most guys are hitting wedges. And, um, you know, that was, that was, that was a transcendent performance, but, um, what, what will it be like to, you know, if there's no tiger when we go back there? Well, we, we've had a lot of that over the years. You know, Patrick Harrington won uh, two opens without uh, Tiger in the field. An open is an open. Uh, and as we found out last year, you can spend a lot of time building up some, I did, crazy expectation of about what Tiger Woods can do at an open because the course is flat, relatively easy to walk. Uh, and then, you know, St. Andrews was St. Andrews. So I'm expecting absolutely nothing from from Tiger uh, at Hoy Lake. Um, but just the name Hoylake, Liverpool, the history of Jones, history of Tiger there. Um uh it's neat that it's neat to be going back there. Uh no one does the rotation. No, well, of course there aren't that many, but uh how the RNA uh organizes its rotation is really like nothing else in golf. It's done with such confidence. And even when it goes to these sort of tried and true courses, uh like Hoylake, they somehow have this magic formula of allowing just enough time that you're like, oh, I'm happy to be back here. It's not an exciting golf course, but it's just really neat to be there. You know, I, I mean, it, you and I were both there. We both saw, you know, Tiger just hit. Lynx golf has been said a million times. It's not really about putting. It's about hitting irons on the face, in play, in the wind. Uh, there's a majesty in that, just like seeing Tiger play that second shot into 15 the year that he won at Augusta. Uh, um, won most recently, 2019. Uh, it's majesty. It really is golf. So I'm already, I hadn't been part of this conversation, but just having this conversation does make me excited about going back to Hoylake. Uh, we better book our rooms for that downtown Marriott. Uh, now it's probably too late. Noted. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> that is a good call. <laughs> See, this is what we care about. Fire, covered- Fire pit is not, not the best at booking outside. <laughs> <it>. Like we're, <laughs> We're not the timeliest people, and we know the dates. In fact, we we could book our hotel for the twenty thirty nine U.S. Open today. <laughs> I think um, that's a good reminder. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, and I will say I'm, I'm planning to go to the first. If you want an off season, how about Live Golf? I mean, they've just shut down for months and months. But um, I, I'm going to go to the first event in uh, at Mayakoba. That's my that's my intention because I think that's going to be interesting. I think there'll be a lot of news coming out of that week and. Let's say Liv wants to be disruptive. Is that a true or not true statement? Yes, 100%. Okay. What could be more disruptive for these Liv people than to have an event opposite the Masters for <laughs> mega, mega, mega bucks? 
And this would be my caveat. An invite to this one-off tournament, not part of the Lib Series, anybody who has ever won the Masters or finished in, or finished second, <laughs> by which you would get Johnny Miller and all the you know <laughs> various other Len Matisse, I think all the uh, L- yes Louis Oosthuizen, uh all the various people who have either won or not won, they're going to get a massive paycheck just just to show up uh, and. Uh, I don't know how closely you follow IndyCar racing, but it never worked out for the Michigan 500. Uh, <laughs> the, the Michigan 500 was opposite of the Indy 500, and uh, that's what they did. They put on a high-priced 500 opposite of the Indy 500, and uh, it didn't work. And it and it basically has ruined IndyCar racing, and it is a great uh, look into the scary future of golf. It, it, the, the breakup of IRL and cart. This is super deep for people that don't know any car racing. This is super nerdy, but IRL and cart were the two warring factions and it ruined any car racing. It has never regained the popularity of once. Wow. Had. Well, that's right. I did not know any of that. That's uh, that's very telling Ryan. And that's why, that's why Fred Ridley and company have, have such a big mandate here to try to figure out how to get golf on one page, if it can be done, if you know, yeah. based on the example you just cited. Yeah, I've been reading about the USFL. You've been reading about the ABA. Like it's, there's rarely enough stars in any sport to support two leagues. There just there just isn't, and um, golf especially, where you're rooting for the individual and not not the you know the team or the the franchise. Like it's um, it, there's there's not much precedent. I mean. Cricket did go from this this very long, onerous four or five day uh, match, and they introduced kind of a a, a one day um, sort of sort of fast and furious kind of version of cricket, which has become hugely popular. And that would be the one the one sport that reinvented itself successfully. But uh, anyway, yeah, okay, we we should probably end this this preview before it's two thousand and twenty four. But um, uh, it's always fun to talk off with you guys and, uh, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. It, luckily we'll, we'll offer weekly updates on how the 23 season is going here on the fire drill podcast. Uh, so, uh, any, any parting thoughts before we, we release the listeners? Yeah. Um, my sleeper for the PGA championship, <laughs> Olafur Loftson, the highest ranked Icelandic golfer in the world. Since it okay. might possibly snow, <laughs> that, that, that's the kind of reporting. He's we need probably to not right. eligible. He's probably not eligible, but it's fine. He he's might. Got, he's got four months to play his way in. Yeah, he's good. It's fine. Michael, uh, the actor Victor Mature, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, tried to get into the Country Club. Uh, they told him that they didn't take actors. He said, "I have 28 films to prove that's not the case." <laughs> I'm not sure how to top that. <laughs> yeah, you can't. That's Michael. I mean, this is why it's just unreal to be on this play. I love it. No, we're not going to this stories. All right, yeah. gents. All right. Uh, well, for Michael Bamberger and Ryan French, this is Alan. Safe Schiffner. travels. See you, Alan. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Aloha. And uh, we'll do this again next week. Thanks for listening. That's the end. Bye.